2102 with black. D4. Okay, let's go. Let's go, kid. Let's let's go, kid. Okay, no. Okay, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna test our opponent on a line of the London that I played against Gata. And it, it's a line that a lot of people still don't know. So we start with c5, then we take on d4, and you quickly go queen b6. It's a very, very tricky line against inexperienced London players. So he knows that he goes knight c3. Obviously, if you know the first thing about this line, do not take on b2. That leads to a very theoretical line that's good for white. Eric Rosen has analyzed that. But what we do here is we actually go d6. And the zen behind this line is that we have essentially lured, we have lured the knight on c3. And London players do not like positioning the knight on c3, most London players. They much prefer for there to be a pawn on c3. And in my experience, watching students play this, playing this myself, you get... You know, a lot of London players just falter really quickly in these types of structures. So the best thing to do in terms of developing the dark squared bishop, what should we do with it? What seems to be natural to you guys? Definitely Fianchetto. Because if you play e6, you block the other bishop. And even after you play e6, the bishop has nowhere to go. So, so here you definitely want to Fianchetto. And then you want a castle and develop the knight to c6 all the all the normal moves so i'm going to play them very quickly i'm not gonna spend too much time here okay so there's basically a couple ways to play this type of position there's a couple different viable setups in my experience you can now the immediate the immediate knight c6 is a little bit inaccurate because it runs into the move d5 and that sends the knight. It's not a big deal, but allowing d5 with tempo is unnecessary. So I would prefer to develop the light squared bishop first. Now you might, well, where do we develop it? Well, you can put it on f5 or you can put it on g4. If you put it on g4, white will probably play h3. We will trade the bishop for white's knight and then develop our knight to c6, pressuring d4. But I do not particularly like to give up the bishop pair in these types of positions. So... And I'll flesh that out a little bit further after the game. So let's go bishop to f5 instead. And take a sip of my water. It pause the video. And if you are just along for the show, uh, congratulations, you found the move. No, but knight h4 is... But again, knight, a move like knight h4, you're succumbing to one move-itis. One, one move itis has two forms. It's when you make a move because it creates a threat, and when you make a when you're afraid of a move because that move carries a threat. Okay, so so we still so now after knight c6, d5, we have the additional option of going knight to b4, which leads to some tactical complications that I will flesh out after the game. But for now, I will say that oh wait wait let me calculate that a little there 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 ooh no let's do it let's do it let, let's go knight c6 I, I i saw an interesting line there. in case in case white goes d5 here which is not a given because again most london players like they don't necessarily like to make moves like d5 which are very committal but he does and let's go knight b4 that's the whole point of putting the bishop on f5 in order to attack c2 and win a tempo now, the move that initially dissuaded me from playing bishop f5, uh, from playing knight c6, rather, is this move knight f3 to d4, which defends the pawn on c2 and simultaneously puts pressure on the bishop on f5. But after knight d4, I discovered what I think is a good move. So let's see what white does. Most players in the 17, 1800 range here would probably go rook b1 to c1 which is incredibly passive and a bad move. Now, if I were you, I would start thinking what you would do against the move knight d4. Knight e1, okay, close, but very passive. Let's try to deconstruct this position logically. Black has more active, we have more active pieces. But if we, if we waste time or we dilly-dally, white's going to play a3 on the next move. And what we want to try to avoid is a situation where we just have to bring our knight back to a6. That is far from the end of the world. That's okay. 
So if we can't avoid that situation, that's fine, but we should try if possible to make a move that creates a threat. And I might say, well, what is white's biggest weakness? And white's biggest weakness is clearly the D5 pawn. Can we try to attack it? Well, it's not as easy as it seems because if you play queen a5, which a lot of you are suggesting, white can defend the pawn with his bishop, bishop c4 or bishop f3. And I don't see exactly what we have achieved here. I also like the look of knight e4. I really like the look of knight e4. But knight e4, amazingly, white can still go a3. That's a little bit unlucky. Oh, we lose a piece there. Wow. Wow, there's some crazy lines. No, I think I, I, I think the best thing to do for us is to come to terms with the fact that we're going to go knight a6, that, which is okay. And there's no reason to freak out here. Let's just go rook c8. Let's just go rook c8. Let's improve our position. Bring our knight back to a6. And then we can redeploy the knight to c5. And one of the points that I want to make through the prism of this game is that people become super afraid of, of, of moves like knight a6 when there's no reason to be afraid. We will improve the knight shortly, except I also just blundered a pawn. That's just great. I completely forgot about this pawn. I should have should have put the other rook on c8. That was a complete lapse in judgment. Yeah, for, white can simply take this pawn. It's, it's really not the end of the world. It's far from the end of the world to lose a7, but no reason I should have given that away. I should have just gone rook fc. I, I, I just forgot that that pawn hangs. Should have gone rook fc8 so that the other rook defends a7. Let's see if white takes it. We'll pretend this is a gambit. This is a sacrifice. This is a sacrifice. Bishop f3, he doesn't take it. But we're in a bit of an awkward spot here. We're in a bit of an awkward spot because knight c5 runs into b4. I, I, I feel like I've misplayed this. We'll have to look after the game. We need to breathe some new life into this position. Okay, let me let me think. We can sack the exchange on c3. That's an interesting idea, but it is very dubious. I'm not sure that we get enough comp. We can play rook c4 maybe. Let's go rook c4. Let's try to harass him. Just, just sort of a move that that you know, just trying to get get stuff going a little bit, annoy him. Just gotta play chess here. Bishop back to e2. Now sacking the exchange actually is much more appealing, and then playing knight takes d5. I think we're gonna go for it. Yeah. And now we sack the exchange, and this idea everybody should be familiar with. This is the classic exchange sacrifice on c3 which is endemic to like tons of openings Mo probably most commonly sicilian if you're a sicilian player like you have to be aware of that c3 sack hikaru won a game against me through that sack um in the u.s championship it's like it's super super i've won games with the exchange i'll show you both examples and uh, I was told that I have to ask people to like videos on YouTube, so I'm gonna do that. Really helps, thank you. All right, moving on. Knight takes e3. Oh, I probably should have taken e3. Yeah, no, that was bad. I should have taken the e3 pawn. Or was it bad? Hmm. So this is hanging. This is hanging. It looks like I have tactics here, but I don't. Knight c5 is interesting. Bishop c5, dc. Rook e7, queen a3. This one is okay. Let's go knight c5. I'm very concerned about bishop takes c5, though. Ooh, I came up with a knight. Okay, this is one of those games where I am going to have to focus, like, super hardcore, because this guy is amazing. This guy is amazing. Okay, what do we take with? Let's take with a pawn. With a pawn. Thank you, seven. It's gonna happen. Then I suppose we play bishop to f6 to chase the rook away. Try to get it onto an. Wow, bishop d3. Okay. I guess we play rook d8 now. In order to pin the bishop, preparing the move c4. The issue is that white can play queen e3 and get out of the pin. We'll have to check this game very carefully with an engine to see Yeah, and he blunders. That's honestly very sad that he blundered like this because this would have been a very interesting end of the game. Queen c1 is just such a dumb move. 
I mean, it puts the queen right on, right, just on a golden platter, it gives us the win. Bishop takes d3. But, but again, I think what we are seeing in this speed run is that when you create super complicated positions, like even super strong players, they make these blunders all the time. It's a bummer that, that White did this, honestly, and I will criticize my own level of play, which was not very high this game. So maybe I'll learn something too. We'll, we'll, we'll delve in with an engine, and we'll see what the proper way of playing that position is. Well, that's what you get for playing the London, I guess. So we're just going to go straight into analysis with an engine, because... I'm very curious as to a couple of critical moments in that game. The reason I want to use an engine in this game is because I really want to get to the bottom of how we should set up our pieces in that line. So people watching on YouTube might be grimacing, but I'm, I'm very sparing in like my choice of using the engine. Yeah, I guess they're doing a server restart in 23 minutes. So this is probably has to do with that. Okay, so in that case, we'll have to analyze on chess space. So the engine gives an advantage. Okay, knight c3. So Kamsky, Kamsky played the other move here, which is knight a3. So this, if you take the pawn, then white wins. This is very well known. Uh, obviously, these two positions are the same. So knight c3, knight a3 are interchangeable. So this loses to, yeah, this loses. But if we check the, the rev online online database, this position has been played a ton. But people have walked into this. You play knight a6 to defend c7. The move is a3, and the rook is trapped, and the queen is trapped. Knight d5, and look at this. Rook b1, queen a2, and rook b3. This is an amazing move. You sack the bishop, and then you trap the queen like this. Queen is trapped. Really, really pretty construction there. So do not take on b2 if you are if you, if you play this line. As you can see, the engine's top choice is like a6. We played d6. Okay, the engine doesn't love this. The, the new stockfish does not love the move d6. So I guess the most accurate move here is to play actually a6, which is a very interesting move. What is the purpose of a6? I, I think the purpose of a6 is to prepare queen takes b2. Ah, and there's no knight b5. Aha. Uh -huh. So a6 is cool. It, it covers the b5 square, which prepares queen takes b2. And if white plays a move like rook b1, then after d5 already, black is totally fine. Even more than fine. Knight f3. Yeah, bishop f5. And this is like a, a super comfortable London for black. So we can learn that the move is a6, actually. Okay, we played d6. Rook b1 is inaccurate. Rook b1 is inaccurate. But who's going to play a4? Like, who's going to find that move? a4. Again, with the typical idea of expanding on the queen side. Um, a4 is a, is a cool move. And if black just continues along the same lines, then white plays a5. Again, if we take the pawn... Oh, actually, here the situation changes because the pawn is on a5. So you have to give a bishop check on b5. Bishop d7... Trade and knight g2. And white's lead in development and the super awkward queen position means that white has huge compensation for the pawn. So if black plays a5, it weakens the b5 square tremendously. Remember that when you do this, you create a massive hole on b5. Massive hole on b5. And white can stick a bishop there. So that's bad. So white played rook b1, we played g6, we develop our pieces. This is all normal. Okay, bishop f5 is apparently inaccurate because of h3. Okay. Okay, it's all right. h3 is good. Knight c6. d5 is best. Knight b4. Okay, so here there's an insane computer move, which nobody would ever play. Queen d2, just leaving the pawn hanging on c2. A queen, I mean, how do you find such a move? What is the idea? The idea is basically the following. I can see this from Stockfish's line. Bishop takes c2, rook bc1. Now, white is threatening to take on c2, right? So black has to drop the bishop back. If you play 
Ooh, there's a beautiful idea. Let me turn off Stockfish for a second. So wait a second. Let me lock the engine here. Does anybody see what white does after 94? Does anybody see the best move here? Or the best series of moves? Wow, people sleeping. Come on, guys. The queen is hanging. Yeah, knight takes e4, bishop e4, and rook c4. Both minor pieces are hanging. And if you play bishop takes f3, white has intermezzo, rook takes b4 first, attacking the queen, and then white wins a piece. Yeah, all right, let's check the engine. Yep, that's right. That's the line. So knight e4 doesn't work. Black has to drop the bishop back to f5. So now I plays a3 and b4. Restriction. Classic idea, restricting the knight on a6. Now you might look at this and say, why is white better? Black is up a pawn. And this is very hard to explain. The, the way I would think about it, and I, even I would have a hard time evaluating this position, there are several structural problems in black position. First of all, the knight on a6 is, is, is totally out of the game. And if you try to bring it back into the game, then you're going to lose your queen. After bishop e3, the queen is simply trapped. So, okay, Azazi asks a question. In that position, would you take the rook and then take the bishop on e2? Yeah, probably the best that black can do is this. But after rook e1, notice that black is also losing the e7 pawn. So normally this type of position would be okay, but you're also dropping e7 and then d6. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I'll, I'll explain. You can't reactivate the knight. And if you play a neutral move like rook ac8, then you lose the pawn on a7. You lose the pawn back. Now you might say, okay, well, what if I play rook fc8 so I don't lose the pawn? Well, then white still plays bishop e3, and white just accumulates the central pressure. The underlying problem in black's position is that we are super cramped. The pawn on d5 is controlling key central squares. And the knight on a6 is permanently out of the game, giving white excellent compensation for the pawn. White is an advantage. Not a huge one, but a pretty significant one. Why is queen d2 necessary? Queen d2 just defends against the threat. If you play the immediate a3, you blunder in exchange because bishop takes c2 is a fork. So, so queen, queen d2 is a prophylactic move, which takes the sting out of the move bishop takes c2. It makes sure that that move does not come with a fork. But knight e1 is completely understandable. The move I was expecting is knight d4. And here I was planning to play bishop e4. Here I was planning to play bishop e4. But anyways, knight e1 is passive. Ooh, so here the best move is queen a5. But the reason I didn't play it is because of bishop c4. Oh, rook a c8, bishop b3. Okay, and now the exchange sack. So I had the right idea of sacking the exchange, but I didn't find the right moment to do it. So this is just winning for black, just because white's position is totally collapsing. Look at this. Just look at look at look at white's position. And after bishop d2, you go knight e4. Ugh. I mean you're just all over him. Knight c3 is coming. No, this is this is uh this is something I should have seen. I stopped after queen a5, bishop c4. I also thought white has bishop f3. But now I realize that that just drops a pawn on a2. And if white goes rook a1, then you allow knight takes c3 attacking the queen. So these positions are intensely complicated. We played rook a c1, bad move, allowing a3. Bishop b3, queen a5, bishop f3. I was more worried about bishop takes a7, but now we actually have b6. I also did not see that. For some reason, I thought white plays b4 in this position. Oh, knight takes b4. Oh, discovered attack on the bishop. Discovered attack on the bishop. That's what I didn't see. Because I only saw queen takes a3 here, but now white has knight b5, and the queen is in huge trouble. And not just the queen is in trouble, but the knight on a6 is lost after rook a1. This is what I calculated. But I forgot that we have knight takes before here, attacking the bishop. 
Yeah, just so many ideas here that, that are so easy to miss. So white plays bishop f3, which is good. Rook c4 is fine, bishop e2. And this is correct. So we are actually better according to the engine here. But knight takes e3. No, knight takes e3 is okay. Wow, actually, I, I didn't play that badly. It would have been better according to the engine to take the bishop and really ruin white's structure completely. But we took here, we played knight c5. And DC is also fine. Wow. So I'm actually not worse here. I'm actually not worse in this position. That's interesting. We, we have enough compensation. I was a little bit overly pessimistic. I was a little bit overly pessimistic. According to the engine, queen takes e5 is better. Oh, and bishop f6. Yeah, just compensation. Nothing much to say here other than that black has insane peace activity in response for the in, in return for the exchange. Um, but it, it is sad that white that white blundered with queen c1 and allowed bishop d3 and knight d2. In conclusion, we can make a couple of interesting observations, which is that okay, so bishop f5 is disliked by the engine. Bishop f5 is disliked by the engine. The engine feels that the bishop is misplaced on f5. The engine wants us to play a more uh, waiting type of move and wants us to play a6 in order to cover the b5 square and sort of wait for white to show their cards. Oh, and queen back to c7. The engine actually wants to fee and cattle the light squared bishop. This is interesting. I didn't think about that at all. The engine actually wants us to fee and cattle the bishop. Do you guys see that? Queen c7 and then b6 and bishop b7, which makes a lot of sense. So bishop f5 is inaccurate, h3, and then knight c6, d5 is just better for white if he finds queen d2, which is a really hard move. After knight a, knight a5, we missed queen a5, bishop c4, rook a c with the idea of an exchange sack on c3. And then... Bishop f3, rook c4. Yeah, bishop b2 back was a mistake because it takes white's eyes off of the d3 pawn and allows the exchange stack on c3. And this position is just good for black. Yeah, very interesting game. I mean, this kind of analysis is not going to win you any brilliancy prizes. It's not that interesting. But uh, it, it really... And this is something I think that's, that's greatly underestimated. It is the best way to learn how to play complicated positions. You play a game like this, you spend 30 minutes with an engine and by yourself, just like looking around, discovering new ideas. Open, I call this open-ended analysis, right? It's just like you're not trying necessarily to dis understand something specific. You're just trying to like get a sense of what's going on in a particular position what the typical ideas are, which typical mistakes you made. It's not the most interesting activity, but it's incredibly effective, incredibly effective. This is the first time that I exploited this idea. And it, as I mentioned during the game, it came in a Nidorf, which I used to play exclusively, Sozin. So I misplayed the opening here. I misplayed the opening, but Eventually, my opponent misplays it back, and he plays too slowly. Rook c8, rook a1. Black to play in this position. What did I do? And it took me a while to decide on this move. I was like, am I crazy for wanting to do this? Yeah, rook c3. Bang. I'd say, well, rook takes c3 is usually only good when white has to play bc. But, and that's what my opponent did. My opponent played bc. I remember he was thinking for a long time. And the reason he didn't play queen takes c3 is probably because I take with tempo. And look at this knight. Look at the bishop, just the diagonal. The center control the black has. Absolutely worth it. Even though I think objectively, white is probably better here. And probably the reason why white is better is because there's this very nasty idea of white pushing the f pawn down to f5 and creating massive pressure down this diagonal. I don't know what the engine eval is here. My guess would be 0.8, maybe, let's see. Maybe I'm even overestimating White's position, underestimating my own compensation. 
It is, drum roll please, it is, this is an exciting moment. Yeah, I'm right on the money, point, point 0.5. Black is not, oh, it's even equal. Black is, black is not worse. Let's see, is Rick takes you through the top engine move? No, it's not. It's not, the engine just says black is better if you just play normally, which is kind of lame. Queen d7, wow, queen d7. Oh, to prepare a5, to, to prepare queenside pressure with a5. So rook c3 is not the top move, but it's not bad. And bc is a really bad move because, oh, and I should have taken with the knight. But then I found this very nice idea, queen a8. Takes, takes, rook c8. And I just like, I didn't play perfectly, but I, I put enough pressure on him to where eventually I got into this end game and he blundered a fork. Oh no, he did not blunder a fork. He gave me this check. But I outplayed him in this end game. And I was worse for a while, actually. I'm still worse if he finds rook b6. But he didn't find it. And he made a really bad move. What is the tangible benefit to swapping your rook for their knight plus hunt? Well, it's not a swap, it's a sacrifice. Well, the tangible benefit is first of all, okay, first of all, we ruined the structure. Second of all, we have ruined white's pawn center. Third of all, we have gained for ourselves this long diagonal, which might allow us to build a battery with the queen coming to a8 and pressure on g2. So it's not, I, I can't just like, oh, oh, this is a one thing that we gain or the sacrifice. It's like a, it's a sacrifice. And when you gain a couple of different things that, that taken together are supposed to give you enough compensation for a very minor sacrifice. I mean, it's an exchange for a pawn. It's not that big of a deal. Right, and your, your central control is much better. No, but white can't just trade, but it's not easy for white to trade bishops. How, how do you propose that white get, that white trades light squared bishops here? The structure absolutely matters, yeah. The structure matters here, white structure is shit. So it, it definitely matters. And then Hikaru beat me with a very unsound exchange sect that ended up producing a, a super strong psychological effect. So I can show you the Hikaru game as well. You, you can also find it on Agenmater's channel. I think Agenmater did a video on my my game with Hikaru. It, in my defense, this was like my worst, the worst tournament of my life. Um, This was the US Championship 2015. So I was white against Hikaru, this was round five. I think I had like one and a half out of four. No, I had one out of four. So I'm doing badly, but I, I had great preparation in the dragon, which Hikaru played. And I, I had this like rare line prepared with H early H4. And I, I, I got a huge advantage here. Like once I played Bishop G5, I'm like plus minus. So Hikaru takes like 20 minutes and he takes on C3. And I could tell that he was like, BSing because like I, I knew that this I'm like literally up an exchange in the end game but practically speaking it's actually very hard to play this with white because black gets this sustained queenside pressure a b black has better placed pieces and c it's just very hard for white to make any sort of progress so I lost this really quickly I played a3 he goes rook c8 I played king b2 he goes king f8 and at this point, I think I took like 30 minutes and I literally could not find a single plan. I could not find anything that I liked. I should have just played a freaking normal move like Rook HE1. But I was getting nervous because I knew that I was pretty close to actually winning if I played correctly. And I played this horrendous move, Knight E2. Have, this is like such a bad tournament. I don't even know what was going through my mind. Bishop B5. I had to go back to D4. And of course, he doesn't repeat. He improves the position of his bishop. Then he starts getting his knight around to c4. And now I just panic completely. I went f4, another terrible move. We got this position. Now my bishop is essentially trapped, so I have to go f5. And that weakens my structure even further. And, I mean, I just got squashed here. Eventually, I give, gave the exchange back. And, and he just won easily. I mean, this is just terrible, terrible game for, for my, on my part, but... Uh, but you, you can take a look at the Agon Mater video um, for, for more like clear-cut analysis. But if you turn on the engine here, it's like plus 1.5. It's almost winning for white.
Uh, so, so from a purely like objective standpoint, this exchange tag was unsound. It just shows you that that these ideas are out there, and if you do a good job of uh, you know discovering them, then it really enriches your play. This is how you get good at positional chess. Like you see an idea like this, you file it away in your mental Rolodex. Like, oh, this is interesting. Next time you have a position like this, you start considering rook takes c3. You know, you're not as afraid of exchange sacrifices. Then you, you spot another idea. And, and that's how your play starts to acquire that air of erudition because you, you just become aware of all these different ideas. So try to be, my recommendation, try to be a sponge for thematic ideas and then apply them to your own games. There's plenty of games where rook takes c3 is the best move. Yeah, for sure. Um... Because I was not invited, Teddy. All right, guys. On that note, we will end. It's way later than I planned to stream. I have the dentist in four hours and 59 minutes. I'll see you guys later. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you for hanging out. Bye, bye everybody.